Uh, anyway, it was during uh, Black History Month last year that we hosted Dr. Quintard Taylor for a special talk. And in his overview of our state's, our state's unique black history, he gave a prominent role to the focus of today's talk, and that's the father of Centralia, a son of a former slave. And they're going to be talking about this in just a moment. But he also highlighted the two people that were in our audience that day and honored them for their work writing about that man, George Washington. And those two people are our speakers today. They're co-authors of a book about that amazing man and his wife, quite a story. And uh, after the talk, they're willing to sell and sign books and talk with you. And uh, that's a big crowd, but you're going to handle it all right. Uh, Brian Mitke is one of the authors who has recently been hired by the Association of Washington Business as its communication specialist. Uh, he most recently served as editor of the Chronicle newspaper in Centralia. And uh, Brian's a Washington native with a bachelor's degree at SPU, and uh, he majored in English literature and minored in computer science. So Shakespeare and computer. He, he had to watch computers by candlelight in those days. But he lives, he lives in uh, Chehalis. And then uh, from Napavine, Carrie McGregor Searle is the other author with us today. And she's worked as an environmental toxicologist, epidemiologist, give me all these big words to pronounce here, and freelance writer. Uh, Carrie has been an avid genealogist for 38 years. And fortunately, she had a brain injury two years ago. And reading and writing have been rather difficult since. But we're pleased to say that she's bravely working towards recovery. And let's give them both a big Schmidt House welcome for <laughs> Carrie Searle and Brian Mitke. Thank you, Don, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Brian, and I'm really glad to have my co-author, Carrie Searle, here. I'll be doing most of the talking, uh, but Carrie is going to jump in on some of the areas that she um, has kind of a special knowledge in. But I do want to acknowledge her as a co-author. This book uh, started when um, Centralia was observing the bicentennial of George Washington's birth uh, starting in 2017. And I was uh, writing a column for the newspaper, and I wrote a column saying that uh, this is a big deal for the city of Centralia. I don't even live in Centralia. I live kind of outside Chehalis, Napavine. I said, someone ought to really do a big observance. The city ought to celebrate this remarkable Northwest pioneer and observe. And people responded and said, yes, somebody should do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote another column six months later saying, guys, this is coming up. Somebody really ought to do something. And so I ended up saying anybody who's interested show up you know, at this date at the Centralia Library. And I don't know, we had 30 or 40 people show up. So it was a, an incredible um, event. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that bicentennial. Uh, but as part of that, I wanted to read everything that had been written about George Washington. So there's a, a history book that was written in the 1940s that has a little chapter on him. So I read that and then researched, OK, I'll read all the other biographies on him. And there were none, which was shocking to me. So I said, well, this, this old um, history book is, is very inaccessible. He's just one chapter out of many. I'll, I'll take that. Copyright is, you know, not a, <laughs> I'll figure out the copyright issues later. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll rewrite that, add whatever new we have, and, and you know, publish that as a little, you know, brochure for, for the bicentennial. And the project kind of grew and grew, and Carrie, I had told her about it, and she kept sending me all this incredible information. I thought, wow, this is great. I'm going to have to really give her a prominent place in the, you know, the acknowledgments. And then the more she sent me, the more I started feeling like this is, she deserves more than that. So I asked her if she would co-author the book, and uh, incredible uh, resource for her um, uh, knowledge and and her ability to research and discover so many things. So uh, most everything uh, good in the book, Carrie discovered. So I, I want to acknowledge that. And yeah, so the book we um, uh, let me let me just get started talking a little bit about the bicentennial. So uh, George Washington, what we kind of came to the um, conclusion as we talked about it as a group was that he really has just an American story that is, I think there are few equals. He was born in Virginia, and again, I'm going to get more into this, but a uh, child of a slave and a white mother, and uh, he faced a life of slavery, but his mother uh, allowed him to find a life of freedom. He came west with a foster family, uh, crossed on the Oregon Trail, founded a town. So kind of both sides of the American slavery issue and, and the Western movement. Uh, really beautiful quote there from one of his, his good friends. 
Uh, can you guys read that in the back, or should I read that? Read okay. <laughs> George Washington was a kindly man and had such a kindly countenance, yet was a man of determination, vision, energy, and he was a liberal man, contributing freely, freely to any cause that he considered right. And his personal motto was peace and plenty, which is just a beautiful phrase, and we'll talk a little bit more about how he lived that out in his life. And so our bicentennial group, uh, one of the things that made it so exciting was that we all knew a little bit about George, but none of us knew a lot. And so we were all kind of reading, you know, this little chapter in the history book, you know, and, and figuring it out themselves. So each time we'd come to this meeting, we'd say, oh, do you remember this? Did you find this out? So it was really, really a cool sense of discovery uh, that felt very contemporary, even though it was 200 year old history. And as we uh, kicked off this bicentennial, there's a two story mural in downtown Centralia that was installed in the 1980s. Uh, a colorized version of this same picture of George Washington that's on the cover of the book. And uh, <laughs> so I came to one of our meetings that we had uh, monthly or, or so in Centralia, and I went by the stat this, this mural, and it, it was gone. And, and I was shocked and dismayed and stunned and, and all the other things. And so um, I called the city and I called the bank that it's sitting on and I called the law firm that had sponsored it 30 years ago and nobody knew where it was. There's a tiny little card in the bottom that said being restored by Spectrum Painting. So I looked them up on the internet and called and found this guy, Todd Watson, who uh, just said, oh yeah, I, you know, George is a great guy. Uh, just, I'm really inspired by his life, and so every couple years, you know, since I'm a painter, I just restore the painting and just put it back up. <laughs> and it's just, to me, that exemplified uh, the sort of can-do, community-minded spirit that George had. So Todd has been doing this since long before we had this bicentennial. He, he learned about it, so that was really fun. And when, so when they came out to restore that, uh, the Chamber of Commerce came out and gave them all free donuts, and it was just a really, really cool way to kick off this bicentennial. So, I listed here some of the things that we did as part of that, and I sent around um, a little pamphlet that I put together, sort of a, a scrapbook. But we uh, got together and we said, well, let's have a big hundredth birthday party for George, and what could we do? And we started thinking, and the ideas got so big, and uh, someone, it might have been me, it might have been someone else, suggested, let's make a statue of George in the park and that idea kind of caught fire and so we said well let's start the bicentennial observance on his 200th birthday and we'll do a year-long event and we'll dedicate the statue at the end of it and that was a pretty big goal but we had uh, a really fun community birthday party for him with we wanted to make it kind of old-fashioned so people came in their pioneer garb and we had a, a woman there demonstrating uh, spinning and and she had a knitting wheel, and we played old-fashioned games, you know, and um, kids threw water balloons at me, and uh, it was really fun. We had a pioneer-style church service in the park that was fantastic. We rededicated Centralia College's Washington Hall, which is on Washington Street, which is, um, I, I don't know, was it named after George? We don't know, but they officially rededicated it in honor of George Washington on his 200th birthday. Former State Supreme Court Chief Justice uh, Gary Alexander came down for that event. Uh, it was really, really cool and meaningful. Uh, we had a lot of educational outreach in the schools that was just uh, so neat. And uh, then we, we had this statue, and um, I like to give credit where it's due. So I had suggested, let's build a statue of George Washington in his namesake park. And I was talking with a local sculptor that we have in Centralia, or in Chehalis, and he said, yeah, it's gonna be about $100,000. And I said, oy vey. <laughs> And so, so we're talking a little more, and my wife walks by, and here's the conversation with my wife, Sarah, and she said, you know, if you're going to make a statue of George, you ought to make a story of his wife, too, because they were partners in this. And it was one of those ideas that as soon as you hear it, we're like, well, obviously, we should do that. I, yeah. So, and, and there's a, a chapter in here on Mary Jane, his wife, that Carrie's going to talk to you about. Mary Jane was a really, really interesting um, person in her own right with a story that's just very unique. And they were partners. It was, it was really cool. It was George's land. He had homesteaded it, but once they laid the, the streets out, Mary Jane named the streets. Uh, and there's kind of personal stories about why she named them those things. So that was really cool. Um, the, the statue project really just became a, a can I say it was a galvanizing event? Um, <laughs> Uh, the, st uh, the sculptor, Jim Stafford, uh, Seattle Times came down and put us on the front page, which was really incredible. Uh, just how timing works in life. We were building the statue, you know, a largely uh, Caucasian community building a statue of an African-American founder at the same time that communities were tearing down statues of Confederate, you know, um, soldiers. So kind of that contrast, I think, is what caught their attention. But uh, really, really neat to, to build that statue. Um, we had more than 200 individual donors that gave to that. 
which was just so cool. Um, one guy, I think he gave like $4, and he said, I'm sorry I can't give more, but I think this is a really neat project. Uh, the capital budget, Senator John Braun helped us get uh, money from that as well. So we dedicated it on the, the one year, the, the end of our one year bicentennial, which is just mind blowing that we were able to do that. Uh, really fun, it poured rain on that day, it just poured August 11th, which is normally the driest time of the year. Uh, so, but what was really cool is, so we're going to do the dedication, you know, and we're watching the weather, you know, which way are the storm cells coming and everything, and it's so wet. And right as they lifted the tarp off, the clouds lifted and the sun came out. It was, and I'm not even kidding, I mean, it's really, really, it was a great event. So you can see how sunny it is there and how wet we all are. Uh, there's our group photo um, that we took, so you can see, you can see George and Mary Jane there, and there's me, there's my daughter, anyway. Um, so uh, when, we, when we started writing the book, uh, there, there was actually one book that had been written about George before. It's called The Man Who Founded a Town by Esther Hall Mumford, and that's a, a photo of her with the statue, so that was really special that she, she and her husband were able to come down from Seattle for the statue dedication. Uh, neat book, children's book, and, um, but we thought that something more was deserved. So uh, th this is a cool photo because Carrie found this literally as we were about ready to send the book to print. And she emailed me. She said, stop the presses. <laughs> and I'd stayed up all night for a week putting the book together. and like, let's put it in the second edition. So you guys, I think, are about the first ones to ever see that photo um, since we discovered it, at least. It was kind of hiding in plain sight, but that's a different story. Um, so that's a young George. Uh, his his life story. So he was born. We really tried to discover his his true identity, and we weren't able to do it because of you know the the lack of records. And but what he said is that he was born within 10 miles of Winchester, Virginia. Winchester, I, interestingly, was where Pre General George Washington or Colonel George Washington, whatever he was at that time, got his first start in public office. He first ran for office in the mid 1700s in Winchester, uh, before becoming you know the general in the in the revolution. Uh, George's um, father was an enslaved uh, black man, um, supposedly named Washington. Uh, his mother was a white woman of English descent. And shortly after George was born, his father was sold. And there's a lot of speculation about what relationship uh, the mother might have had to, you know, a, a plantation or, or, you know, or to that the owner of that slave. So, um, so his his mother, to save his life, gave him away, uh, and just a really um, heartbreaking, heartbreaking uh, decision. And uh, she gave him to this couple, James and Anna Cochran, and they were um, uh, just a loving uh, parent, set of parents for them, and a really, really cool, to me, it's interesting. You're surprised by where emotions take you sometimes, but when I read back through the book, the thing that kind of chokes me up a little bit is the relationship between George and his foster parents because they agreed to raise him until he was 21 as their own, uh, which is really something uh, to, to do that for a black child uh, in the pioneer lands. And they were going to Missouri, which wasn't necessarily a friendly place. But then when he turned 21, he said that he would um, take care of them until they died. And he did. And by the end of their lives, they were, they were old and infirm. And uh, he, they says George had to care for his foster mother like she was a baby. Uh, but he did. He took care of them. And he was proud of that, uh, that he did that. Uh, they came through a couple different states. They, they always stayed on just the very, very edge of the frontier. And uh, George learned all the frontier arts, you know, how to shoot and, you know, sew. And he, kept, he was very proud of his skills. Uh, he sewed his own clothes for the rest of his life. And even when he was an elderly man, he loved to, like, throw a can up in the air, boom, 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 you know, and yeah. shoot it as it comes down. Um, he ended up settling in Missouri. Uh, really interesting, his, his foster father, uh, James Cochran found it, it was right in the center of founding a town in Missouri and Carrie found all sorts of really really cool information on that in here so nobody knew until Carrie discovered it that George had a front row seat of a town being founded when he was in his early 20s so he um, he was able to take that knowledge and use it you know 30 years and thousands of miles away uh, but in in this town he built the first brick house in the town um, I think one of the first town meetings was held in the house that George built. Uh, he started different businesses. Um, there's a really interesting story where he uh, had a lumber mill and um, sold some wood to a customer named Jeremiah Coyle. 
and the customer refused to pay, and so George instituted a legal suit against him, and because of the way the laws were, were written and stacked against people of color, George actually was found guilty and was jailed, and really faced a, a very, very bleak future, but his foster father petitioned the Missouri legislature to give him the rights of a, a what, to exempt him from some of the racist laws in the state, and it passed. And so um, George had his, his own law, you can see it there, uh, an act for the benefit of George Washington, a free man of color uh, of Macon County, Missouri. So it's, it's a short law, but it, um, it, it literally was his law that exempted him. And even years later, uh, he was here in Washington State, Civil War was passed, you know, uh, amendments were passed, but he, for some reason he thought it important to write back to Missouri and have that law read into the, the, the county records in Lewis County. So this was clearly important to him for the rest of his life. Um, so, but even with this law, he tried to start uh, a, a distillery and the laws were stacked against him on that too. And he just, he finally threw up his hands in disgust and he said, I'm gonna get a couple of yoke of cattle and I'm going to Oregon. If there's a decent place in this world, I'm going to find it. And his foster parents said, take us with you. And so they all came west together. And uh, we don't have a lot of George's life in his own words. He wrote one short essay about his life that was published in a newspaper in the 1890s, uh, which there's a copy of that in the back table by the book. Did I mention the book's for sale? Uh, um, but uh, in his life story, he says, my whole life has been that of a pioneer following the receding Indians until my final settlement in Washington Territory, then almost unknown. And that drawing was from the Los Angeles Times. They did a, a story on him in the 1960s. So he came, uh, came west, and there's, um, I'm gonna skip, skip a little bit, but his trail on the, or his journey on the Oregon Trail is really, really incredible. There's stories he told about it, there's stories that others told about it that kind of became legendary in Centralia, so it's hard to know exactly what happened, but kind of the kind of stories you'd associate with a Western, you know, from the, from the old days. But he ended up um, in Oregon, he got very sick in Oregon, he almost died. Um, he lost all his hair as a result of the mercury treatment that they gave him to take care of his disease. So he was bald for the rest of his life, uh, which, you know, was fine. But once Centraeus started growing up a little bit and he became a little more of a prosperous man of means, he got uh, a wig. So he would wear a brown wig around town, uh, but on Sundays he would wear a black wig uh, to be formal <laughs> for church. Uh, so. Uh, this is a map of Centralia. So if you know the Centralia factory outlets, they're about up here. Um, what river is that? This is the Chehalis River, and this is the Skookum Trek River. Uh, so Walmart would be down here, if you kind of know that geographic area. Um, great coffee stand called Fiddler's Coffee that's right about here. <laughs> um, but this is a, a map from the, that's in here, it's the early 1850s, that shows his farm, and that says Cochrane. So that's the cabin right there. And that actually, we think there's a, there's, a, there's a lake here now that I think probably covers up his homestead or most of it. Um, this quote is allegedly from George. I said we have very little in his own words, but there's a really interesting story written about him uh, in the 19, probably 20s or 30s by a guy who had known him back in Centralia's early days named George Keir. And it was called George Washington's Dream. And I found it in the, Centra or in the Lewis County Historical Museum, and it's these old, faded, mimeographed copies. And it was this guy saying, oh, you know, George Washington came into my, into my shop and was so excited and told me this story. And so it's probably fluffed up a little bit, but there's a contemporary newspaper report from the 1920s or 30s that Carrie found of, of the same gentleman talking about having known George. So there's some truth to it, but the quote is, I traveled across this grassy prairie to its western edge where I came to the junction of two rivers. It was a beautiful sunshiny day. A gentle breeze waved the tall green grass in beautiful rolling waves. The wonderful trees that bordered the little grassland was like the dark green frame of a splendid picture. So that's, that's George uh, supposedly describing where he settled. So he um, uh, settled in, um, actually I'm gonna back up, um, in the area that, that is Centralia now. And uh, while he was there, he uh, built a little cabin. And this is what, 1852, I think. 
And there's a, another famous story where, you know, you had, you had a cabin, so by default, you would put someone up for the night if they came through your area. It was just hus hospitality on the frontier. So these two people came by and stayed in George's cabin, and he overheard them talking, saying, basically, this guy can't homestead the land, so let's go up to Olympia, file on the land, we'll come back, tell him what happened, we'll offer him a couple hundred bucks for his improvements, and he'll have no choice but to take it. So George overheard this. He hightailed it down to Toledo, or the Callitz Farm, as you guys heard about two weeks ago. And his foster parents were living there. And he uh, said, hey, can you homestead the land for me? Uh, the laws at the time, you had to be white to homestead. And so they managed to get, get their kind of right ahead of the, um, these two uh, scalawags and uh, homesteaded the land under the name of James and Anna Cochran. So the 640 acres that basically constitutes um, Centraya's exit 81 up through downtown Centraya uh, came under George's name. So next section, I think. Is this the outline of his land? Um, no, this is his cultivated area. Right, so th the uh, we'll get to a map in a couple, yeah, that shows the entire area. So this is just one little part, okay. but this was um, a map uh, showing prairies and improved areas. Yeah. So I think Carrie's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the next part here. Go, go Introduce it. Okay. So, uh, you know, because of this type of incident that had happened, um, and, and some of you might know that Oregon Territory at this time had racial exclusion laws that George wasn't even legally allowed to be here. Uh, it was written into the, the laws of Oregon Territory at the time. Blacks could not reside. Uh, there was even a lash law attached to that. And so that's why George came to Centraya, and it's why George Bush came to Tumwater, is even though it was still in the Oregon Territory, it was far enough away from the seat of government that they figured they could kind of fly under the radar screen until maybe the laws changed. So George Bush, who I'm sure almost all of you know, or all of you know, uh, was African-American who settled uh, here in Tumwater. And George, just a couple years later, then settled in Centraya, and it was all to get away from, uh, you know, sort of the scrutiny of the, of the uh, racial exclusion laws. And by the way, so George Bush, some of you might have heard him referred to as George Washington Bush. Uh, it wasn't. It was just George Bush. And we think that it was kind of a conflation of the two individuals that has led that. So you still hear everyone give him that uh, incorrect middle name. But nope, just not President George Bush and not President George Washington. Yeah. Um, so, but one thing, and, and actually George Bush um, had a, a really hard time getting his. Um, title to his land. It actually literally took an act of Congress, if I understand it correctly. George Washington had a much easier time uh, he, for various reasons. But this is a really, really cool thing that shortly after George arrived here, uh, his neighbors, and by neighbors, I mean 30 or 40 miles in every direction, signed this petition to the Oregon Territory Legislature, just like he had had in Missouri, saying, we don't want you to change all the laws, but this guy's OK. Let, let this guy stay. So I'll read a little bit to you. It says, we, the undersigned, beg to represent to your honorable body the case of George Washington, a freeborn mulatto man, a native of the state of Virginia, who emigrated to this territory in the summer of 1850 across the plains, hoping to find in the genial climate of Oregon what was denied him in his native state the inestimable boon of health, which he has found beyond his most sanguine expectations. So uh, this petition, oh, here we go. Before he emigrated to the territory, he was not aware of the passage of the law forbidding colored people from residing in the territory. Since he has been residing among us, his conduct has been that of an honorable, industrious, law-abiding man. Your petitioners would therefore pray your honorable body to draft a special act in his favor, granting him the privilege of residing in the territory. So you can see all the signatures there. And some of them are, you, you can't really read them, but they're names that are well known. And the signatures go on. And um, they include some folks that um, Carrie can talk about here. So the names on the petition are from Cowlitz Landing all the way up to um, what's now Lacey, Chambers Prairie, and include the Gabrielle Jones from the Bush Party, Edmund Sylvester, the founder of Olympia. And the list goes on. Yeah. Uh, Alonzo Poe, um, the Chambers of Chambers Prairie, uh, the um, 
Pattisons of Pattison Lake, uh, Antonio Rabison, oh, and Daniel Bigelow, uh, Quincy Brooks. So, yes. um, we don't know if he stood in, he or his friends stayed in one spot and had people come to them, for instance, like at the Cochrane Hotel down at Cowlitz Landing, or if he traveled around. But I, I'm kind of thinking by the loose, lo very loose clustering of names by location that he probably traveled around while he was looking for his property he wanted to settle, maybe did some odd jobs and had people sign as they got to know him. So their, their plea was successful, and the Oregon Territorial Legislature uh, passed a law uh, in late 1852. Do I have that day right? No. Yeah. Um, saying that George Washington, a man of color of Thurston County, which for some reason, uh, Centralia was in Thurston County at that time, is exempt from the provisions of the act passed at the first session of the Legislative Assembly entitled an act to prevent Negroes and mulattoes from coming to or residing in Oregon and that said George Washington is permitted to reside within the limits of the territory. So um, one, one part of the story that I think is important is part of what makes George Washington's story so unique is that through just an incredible sequence of unusual events that stacked on each other, a lot of which were related to his amazing white foster parents, he was able to homestead in a way that would have been unremarkable for you know, uh, a white person. So he had white neighbors around him in Centralia that just came and settled, and that was that. But George had to literally have an act of the legislature to be allowed to live here, literally had to race up to, to uh, Olympia to uh, have his white foster parents sign title on the land. So part of the reason his story is so unique is because of the barriers put up against him uh, that fortunately he was able to overcome, but just, just barely. Uh, here is the... Um, the uh, homestead papers for his white foster father, uh, James Cochran. So he had to sign in, being duly sworn, says that he is a white settler on public lands. So again, it literally was written into our laws that um, you know the Homestead Act didn't apply if you were not white. And I was talking to my kids about this this morning. I mean, those, those impacts still obviously continue 150, 160 years later. So uh, we'll skip ahead a little bit. So that was 1852. Uh, he settled. He built a little cabin. You know, ha got along with his neighbors more or less, um, <laughs> or they got along with him more or less. But in 1872, the railroad was going to come through the eastern end of his property, and he saw that that was a big opportunity. By then, he had met Mary Jane and married, and we're going to get to her in a little bit. Um, and you know, he said this could be a big opportunity. So uh, he. Platted out, we found this newspaper article, Kerry found it, from 1873, saying a new town called Centerville has been laid out on George Washington's farm on the Skookum Chuck, about 10 miles from Tenino. Several buildings are already under construction. So if you need to know where Centralia is, it's about 10 miles from Tenino. Uh, right, <laughs> yeah, or it's the river. Um, so uh, he, um, they platted out the town, and this document, it's a little bit hard to read, um, but this is in his own hand, which is kind of neat. Uh, this is him and Mary Jane laying out the streets of the town, describing how wide the streets would be, saying that they were all open for, my favorite part, he said it was open to any actual settlers, E-N-N-Y. So any actual settlers. And that's part of what makes this story really neat as well. And Quintard Taylor said this, that there were other African Americans who started towns, but typically they were enclaves, they were uh, places of respite, they were places geared for blacks to settle because there were so few other opportunities for them, uh, which is really powerful and important. But for George, he opened his town up to anybody and he wanted to sell it to anybody, black, white, whoever wanted to be there. And that's pretty cool. The other thing that was really neat is that he said, I'll sell it to anyone, any actual settler, if you're an actual settler. He didn't want people to speculate, come in, buy the land, sell it, fly by night. You know, that's no way to build a solid town that would last. So he kept his prices low. And he said, yeah, I'll sell you this property, but you have to stay here. And so we have some information. People were skeptical. They said, why would this guy sell me this land for only $10, you know, this lot, when he could get 30 or 40 for it? 
and he said, ah, you know, if you do $10 per a lot and do it out per acre, that's, you know, hundreds of dollars per acre, that's all it's worth. Um, but he wanted to make a place that people would stay and could stay. Um, so that, that's a pretty neat part of his legacy as well. So here's kind of the initial layout of the street. Um, streets George Washington Park is right here. The library is right here. Our statue is right there. Um, and by the way, we were initially going to put the statue right in the center of the park, right in the heart of the park. But the, the mayors, uh, the two mayors of the city um, in sequence said, no, let's move it out by the street so it's more accessible. So now if you drive down um, Pearl Street in Centre, the, the parks, the bench is right there that you can sit by the statue. So here's another uh, kind of map of how he laid the streets out, the public square that was really important to him. Uh, and that's currently the home of the Carnegie Library. Here's what Centuria looked like kind of in the, what, 1870s, 1880s. Kind of a neat little, yeah, furniture and undertaking, take your pick. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you need. <laughs> they got you, the whole range of life. <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. And they got a drugstore there kind of for that transition between the two. So, uh, and this is the outline of his homestead. So his cabin was right about here in that um, cultivated area is right about there. So here's exit 71 in Centralia. Our hospital is over here. Uh, downtown is, is right over here. Centralia College is right here. So that's one of the cool things about dedicating Washington Hall at Centralia College to George Washington is it literally is right in the center of his, of his um, homestead there. Uh, and over time, you know, as he sold lots off, he moved to different areas around there. All right, so now we've got Mary Jane, so I think uh, Carrie can talk a little bit about her. So I want to talk about the different females in the story. And uh, before I talked about Mary Jane, I wanted to mention um, the Cochrans came with a granddaughter, Sarah Jane Fletcher. She um, was sent to Olympia to go to school because there was no schools down there. Um, and so she uh, boarded with the Willard family. And then when, when she grew up, she married one of the Willard sons who became a doctor. Um, so Mary Jane was um, born in Louisiana. She is described as having one black grandparent and three Jewish grandparents. She lived in Victoria by 1860 in a fairly large black community and married Stacy Kunis Sr. Um, Stacy had a step had a daughter already, Emily Kunis. And they had a son together. Um, Mary Jane and Stacy had a son named Stacy Kunis Jr., who was born in October of 1861. But by 1868 she came to Olympia. Her, her husband, Stacy Kunis Sr., was not a, a good husband. He cheated on her, uh, treated her most cruelly um, beat her and abandoned her. So we don't know why she came to Olympia, but my, I'm always thinking that she got on the mail boat that went up and down Puget Sound and said, how far will this boat take me from my husband? <laughs> so George met Mary Jane on a trip to Olympia and she divorced um, Stacy Kunis 10 days before um, meeting or before marrying him, but um, a mutual friend introduced the two. And they, the friend was interested in Mary Jane for himself. And George would laugh later and say, "Most rivals don't, you know, don't don't introduce you to um, <laughs> the woman they they want." But he said, "I'd not be the one to step in and try to take another man's girl away from him." But he let down the bars, and well, I walked on through. <laughs> the marriage certificate hangs in the Centralia Timberland Library, which is located on, in George Washington Park, which is that square that he donated to the city. It doesn't say that he was, they, they were married in Olympia, but the minister and the two witnesses and Mary Jane all lived in Olympia. So probably it happened in Olympia. Thomas Park and James Bush were the witnesses. They were African Americans living in Olympia at the time. James Bush is not related to the pioneer George Bush. 
So they were married April 7th in 1869. Another family came to Centralia in early 1889. This is 20 years after Mary Jane and George got married. Um, unfortunately, the um, husband, William Brown, passed away soon after arriving in Centralia. So his wife, Charity Brown, was alone with three children, all under age 10, including a two-year-old. And she had been orphaned herself at age 11, and one of her four children died very young. Um, and George and Mary Jane provided her a good deal on a land and a house. Unfortunately, Mary Jane then passed away the next month at only age 49. After Mary Jane's death, George gave Charity a job as, as his laundress and housekeeper, and then asked her to marry him. Mm, water. So they had, a, they had a son together. George Cleveland Washington was born in December of 1891. This is George, George's first child, and George is 74 years old. So then he had three um, stepchildren, uh, George, Cora, and Lola Brown. Um, Charity and George did add a few plots to Centralia, and she plotted some more after George's death. We think their marriage was good for about three years, but Charity filed for divorce in 1896. These two did not get along. Um, it, the divorce decree is about, I don't know, 90 pages or something. Oh. <laughs> um, they didn't, um, you, they had different views on how to handle money. Uh, he was adamant about not taking out on credit and she bought on, liked buying on credit. <laughs> they had some child raising differences, um, but obviously from the descriptions, their personalities did not mesh well. Um, so she filed for, is there another page or? No, that's the last Okay. Um, so she filed for divorce, but um, they, they, she eventually dropped the suit, and then they divide, kind of divided up property and lived apart. In 1902, they did get a divorce. He filed for divorce because she started charging him $25 a signature for every time he wanted to sell some of the land. <laughs> which was also done by um, the husband of Eliza Saunders Barrett, yeah. Yeah, who um, founded um, Shehalis. Mary Jane had a son, Stacy Kunis, who, when he grew up, he married Mary Victorine Hickling. He met her on a trip to Portland, and it was love at first sight. I, I really think she's an incredible woman. She was a fellow Victorian of her Portland High School, She's described as, as um, she described herself as being one eighth African American, but her family, her ancestors were from all over. Um, Morti Morticius, um, the Sandwich Islands, um, and she was born in Vic Victoria. She was a gymnast and a boxer in the 1880s. She studied with the first Jack Dempsey, who's not the more known Jack Dempsey, but um, the one from Fort Portland. She was a talented musician, sh uh, singing, um, playing the organ, and, and she and Stacy whistled together too. And she was a great orator. She often gave speeches for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which had their state conventions in Centralia quite a few times. And then she was a gold miner. She had her own gold mine in East Lewis County. This is not she and her husband. This is just her gold mine. <laughs> she was also a teacher, and she um, taught in a lot of the little mining towns around Centralia and um, at Seltzer Valley School and eventually Centralia High School. They had one daughter together, Audrey Kunis. And she also was very 
talented musician. She'd play uh, concerts in Seattle and Portland. But unfortunately, she died of tuberculosis in 1918. And then her mother cared for her till the end, also died of tuberculosis two years after her daughter. So um, Stacy's said to uh, never have whistled again. Their, their house is still standing on Silver Street in Centralia. You're in that uh, or I'm taking it. I think I'm taking it. My, um, I, I'm, part of, I'm part of American Association of University Women. We, did a, we do a Centralia photo scavenger hunt every once in a while. So we did a one for um, George Washington sites that year. Um, so Stacy lived until 1944, and he is the source of many of our stories about George. All, anything that's colorful probably came from Stacy. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, I would I, obviously you folks all have an interest in history, and I was talking to one of your, one of you who uh, Tina, I believe, who's working on an oral history project. But I would really encourage you, if you have a mind to to preserve old stories, to do that because uh, Centralia, the first fifty years, uh, which is where most of what we know about George comes from. I mean, Carrie found some incredible details, but the the substance of it was from that, it was produced by high school students in the late 1930s and early 1940s. They went and found the old timers in Centralia and just these kids, they took notes in the note cards, the note cards still are in the historical museum. And you know, they talked to Stacy just two or three years before he died and Stacy was the one who had heard all these stories and could tell him about what George's life had been like. So if those high school students hadn't done it, if they hadn't had our, just an incredible teacher uh, who, who led them, Herndon Smith was her name, then we would know almost nothing about George. So if, if you've got a hankering to record stories, I encourage you to do that. Uh, George is a great man of faith. He and Mary Jane were both very devout Christians, and they founded one of the first uh, churches in Centralia, the First Baptist Church. Uh, they donated land for the church. He went and cut down the trees, formed them into planks, you know, built them himself. And uh, uh, the quote here is, he helped those in need and did it with a free heart. He had no use for those who gave for publicity and never cared to have anyone know of the good he did. However, as Centralia grew, new folks moved into town and didn't know why they had to go to church with this, this black guy because some of them didn't like black guys. So one of them said something rude to George at one point, obviously not knowing that he had founded the church. So rather than make a big stink about it, George's way was just say, okay, I'll go found another church. So he founded the second Baptist church. Um, so he did everything there. He was the chief financier uh, to the janitor. Um, and uh, just, just kind of an interesting thing. And there's, there's various stories about this that Carrie again had to, to track down the truth of it. There are different ways that this had been said. But um, another interesting thing, so Centralia um, has a prominent forested hillside in the east part of town uh, called Seminary Hill. And it's named after this really, really cool Gothic building, Grace Seminary, that was indeed a seminary school for religious and musical instruction in the early 1890s. And George and Mary Jane were some of the chief benefactors of the town, of, of this project. Uh, also, another African-American couple, uh, William and Jane Bryan, uh, donated or sold at a lower price the land for the seminary. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting aside that um, George and William Bryan did not get along. Two of the few African-Americans in town um, did not like each other. And uh, as, here's another lesson for you, life lesson. If you want to be remembered well in history, be nice to kids. Because the kids, the high school kids who wrote the history in the 1840s all talked about how great George was and how terrible William Bryan was. <laughs> I think he used to like whack him with his cane or something like that. So, um, you know, what, what's the truth of the matter? But definitely um, George is remembered more fondly. Um, uh, the, sem the seminary ended up uh, falling into disrepair and uh, was later used as a hospital, uh, one of the first... Um, industrial hospitals, incidentally. Businesses came together, ran the hospital to take care of their injured uh, workers. Later, it's now the site of the Centralia Armory. Uh, in the 1890s, Centralia and all of America, especially the Pacific Northwest, fell into a great economic depression. Panic of 1893, 
uh, it was just a really, really hard time. And uh, a lot of the stories about George that come from that time are what those of us in the Bicentennial Committee found most inspiring, which is that he was just, uh, they call him a one-man relief agency, but he would bring in wagon loads of food, bring up bacon from Portland, he'd bring in rice from Chehalis, and he, j he fed people, and he gave them work. And if they couldn't pay him, he said, that's okay. Um, you can't pay on the land I sold you. That's okay, you'll have money one of these days. When you have money, go ahead and pay me. Uh, I'm not going to foreclose. You know, you, you take care of your family. And there's, we're running, I want to leave time for question and answer, so uh, I'll tell the story quickly. But uh, really incredible story. This guy was just um, destitute and no food in the house, no shoes in the kids. Finally came to George uh, as George and Mary Jane were having breakfast with Stacy and just said, you know, my family's hungry. I have nothing. And Stacy said it was the only time he ever heard his mother uh, you know, become angry since she had professed Christianity. She was furious with this guy for not coming to them sooner. How could you let things get so bad? So they took all the food they'd made for breakfast, put it in a tablecloth, sent it home with this guy. Mary Jane went over, helped them out. George put this guy to work and, and gave him work for weeks, months to uh, try to get him back on track. Um, and, and there are other stories like that as well and just really speaks to George's character and why um, I think beyond the fact that he's a notable African-American member of you know, the Pacific Northwest heritage, uh, just an incredibly uh, inspiring human being that um, is uh, notable in his own right. Um, he lived to, to see the town recover from the Panic of 1893. Uh, and um, we found newspapers, Carrie found newspaper stories, you know, the oldest man and, you know, you know, we're not the old, but you know, just really neat little snippets of his life. But he died in 1905. Uh, he was riding in a buggy and the buggy's axle snapped and he was thrown, landed hard, was injured. And um, a week or two later, he passed away uh, in August of 1905. So he was, I think, 88 years old. Um, and he, um, the Seattle Republican was a, a black newspaper up in Seattle, and they wrote extensively about George, a very long obituary that we ex excerpted uh, in this book because it was so great. But one little quote was, he was held in the highest esteem by all who knew him, and his life was spent in doing good for humanity as well as himself. Uh, and when the funeral took place, all the stores of the city were closed in his honor. So uh, his son, George Cleveland, Washington, George's only biological child, um, Carrie discovered this photo as well in cooperation with the Vashon Historical Society. Um, after George passed away, George Cleveland got everything and uh, sort of a conservator of the estate um, sent him to a military college up on Vashon Island where not a drop of spiritus liquor was to be found within a mile of the institution. <laughs> So a good, healthy place for him to be raised. He was on the second string baseball, basketball team as a young man. Uh, that's him in the upper right. I think he looks like Russell Wilson. Um, he, um, he died a hero. He uh, was at the college when a fire broke out and he rushed in to help put out the fire and um, was doused with water, smoke inhalation, and he died of pneumonia a few weeks later, age 19. It was just a few years after, it was just six years after George had passed away. Um, he, um, when he died, uh, everything he owned, which had been everything George owned, passed to his mother, who's Charity, who was George's estranged ex-wife. And so if there had been any papers that George had written, and we don't know if there were. He, he was literate, but he was not. Um, he said later in life that he didn't have the advantage of a good education because it, it wasn't available or he was prohibited. So if George had any papers, um, Charity did not preserve them. Um, so we don't have a lot in George's own hand, but um, the stories that have come down to him uh, are about a man of generosity and uh, vision and quiet but bold Christian charity. Uh, he loved to sing. He was the barbecue around town. If you're gonna have a barbecue, you called George out to cook the meat for you because he was good at that. Uh, he would sing at the top of his lungs, uh, Salem's Bright King. And um, his longtime friend who lived into the 1970s and was quoted in the Los Angeles Times said, when he laughed, you could hear him a block away. He was the most generous man I ever met. He trusted everyone. He gave away nearly all his money before he died. This town is his monument. And a quote from George that does survive that uh, really inspired us in our bicentennial was, I want to do right by my fellow men 
And if I do, I will never lose anything by it. So there is the last photograph known to have been taken of George Washington. And uh, I thank you for coming and we'd love to answer your questions. Yes, please. Is the picture in your presentation of the furniture and the store and the undertaking in the book? It is in the book, it yeah. Is the book. Okay. Uh, yes, question that the presentation's been on George Washington. When I drive around town and see George Washington Bush, is that a different person? Yeah, it's a different person. The question is about George Bush. So Tumwater... Um, kind of the southern part, it was settled by an African-American named George Bush. So again, a presidential name, but um, a different guy. Uh, we don't know for sure that he and George Washington met, but we presume they must have. I mean, there were very few people living here. But yeah, different guy, but came here for the same reason, because um, he wasn't welcome in Oregon Territory proper, so he came to the boondocks. Yes, he was from Missouri, too. Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. Do we know that his middle name was Washington? Yeah. So George Bush, we don't, we think his middle name was not Washington. At some point in time, people said, yeah, we got this George Washington, this George, and they just became conflated in the public imagination. Yes, ma'am. Are there any theories about how his mother and father ended up together? There's speculation, but there's no knowledge. I mean, he didn't say much about it, and it was too, so yeah, Kerry really tried to, f to tease that out, um, but it's, there's so little to go on. There's a story I, d I didn't tell you. Um, so when George was in Oregon, shortly after they, he and his foster parents arrived, before he came north to Centralia, uh, he got very sick and was um, in a military hospital for several months, and his foster mother would come to visit him you know, every day. And one day she brought another person with her, and George talked with the two women, and it was fine, and the woman, other woman left. And his foster mother, Anna Cochran, said, George, don't you know who that was? That was your mother. And that was the only time George ever saw her just an incredible, yeah. So yeah, so last year I wrote this song about George Washington uh, just because he needed a song. He needed a book, so we wrote that, and he needed a song. So hopefully I can, I can make this work here. All right. Okay. Can you guys hear me in the back? And extra points if you can figure out what Woody Guthrie tune I stole for this, okay? <laughs> Born in Virginia in dark slavery's land His father was sold and his time was at hand His mother, she saved him, but oh what a cost She gave George away and her dear son she lost His new mom and dad were the Cochrans and they Raised him with love and to sing and to pray He learned how to shoot neath the misery sky To sew his own clothes and to hold his head high So it's off to the west to grow with the land To build it together if you take a hand He built a brick house and he ran a sawmill But a man there wouldn't pay a negro his bill the law was against george and he was locked up but then the lawmaker said enough is enough with his new law in hand george had rights in a way but he saw that missouri was no place to stay he said to his parents i'm hitting a trail where a man can be free and can write his own tale so it's off to the west with the sun in his face hoping to find just one decent place Over prairies and mountains to Oregon he came But laws in this new land forbade him the same He crossed the Columbia to escape their black ban He built himself a cabin and farmed a free man Two travelers saw George was squatting the land They tried to steal from him all he had planned His family, old Cochran, he lent George his name To legally homestead his Skookum Chuck claim And it's here in the West the best of all places, standing alongside good men of all races. His neighbors signed a petition, a plea, to ask the leaders of the territory to put down their race laws, in his case at least, and the lawmakers voted to leave George in peace. He fenced in the prairie, grew crops on the land He met Mary Jane and he asked for her hand 
together they dreamed of founding a town A heaven on earth for black, white, or brown And it's here in the west, starting anew Making a home for me and for you George walked the dirt roads, laughing and singing In the church that he built, he heard the bell ringing The kids smiled to see him, and the men shook his hand Even those who at first wouldn't touch a black man When hard times came, he gave food to his town Rice by the carload and bacon all around He refused to foreclose when folks couldn't pay He gave work to the people, and he urged them to stay And it's here in the west, in a desperate time that a man's true colors will brilliantly shine. Centralia recovered it as George reached his last days. He tended his town with a proud father's ways. George died when a buggy crashed and he was thrown down for the funeral. The mayor shut down the whole town. Now it's two centuries since those Virginia years. He grew with our country in all of its tears from slavery to freedom. The rise and the fall, his life showed that we can be one after all And it's here in the west that his memory lives For us to renew, to bless and to give And it's all through the ages his words will still ring If I do right by others, I won't lose a thing I think uh, first in line for getting the books will be the lady that has to get on the bus. But after her, <laughs> it, the, uh, both Brian and, and Carrie will be back there to sign and sell books. And if you have a chance to stay a little bit longer, you might want to talk to them too. But uh, thank you for coming. What a great program this has ended up being on a nice day. Uh, we do have another talk coming up uh, and we have the next one on thursday march 12th it's called women who dared and she's a former history teacher and author dorothy wilson or dot wilson and uh, she's going to bring to life some stories you probably haven't heard as a historian because these are white women or non-native women that came here before our pioneer women did i mean on their own i mean this is inter interesting stuff so they paved the way for our pioneer ancestors so that's march 12th right here at the schmidt house